Shavu Atov, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Alon. It's always a special pleasure for me to come back here to Great Neck, to this beautiful holy shul, Baruch Hashem, that always become better every time I come. Uh, we are now, as you know, two weeks before Pesach. Everyone is busy with cleaning the homes, the cars, the offices, which is uh, what the halacha requires. We have to make sure that we don't have chametz. But most of the people forget the most important thing when it comes to Pesach, which means we have to clean the chametz from among us. It's more important to clean the chametz from the heart than to clean the chametz from the house. It's important to clean the chametz from the house. Mitzvah from the Torah. If, we, if a person leaves chametz in his house, three sins from the Torah every second. Lo yerae, bal yerae, bal imatze, en vetashbitu soor mi batechem. It's three different sins. Two, two loves and one mitzvah tase. Every second, multiply by eight days, it comes to about a million sins. If a person leaves chametz in his house. It's very important, better not to leave any chametz in the house. If you only have some cookies and wafers and bread, get rid of it. Even if you have some leftover, give it to the cleaning lady, get rid of it. Five, ten dollars doesn't justify to take a risk. If you have expensive bottles of whiskey, each one of them, fifty, a hundred, two hundred dollars, and you have a lot of them, no, I understand. You don't want to throw them all to the garbage. So then you sell it to a goy. You sell it, make sure you sell it you know, properly. You don't take a risk. You hide it, you cover it, fine. But you have to know one thing. The most important also thing is to make, after we burn the chametz, to make cancellation, to cancel the chametz. Why? If, God forbid, we forgot, and there's all kinds of chametz we didn't check, it could be a whole uh, package of cookies, that you don't know, your son put it somewhere, he didn't check over there, all of a sudden you find it after Pesach. Now you understand that eight days of Pesach here in America, every second you had chametz in your house. The cancellation saves you. Like I say, for million sins. Few words you say, kol chamira deika birshuti, all the chametz that I have in my position will be dismissed, will be afra the ara, will be like the sand on the ground, but then, after Pesach, if you find chametz, then this chametz must be destroyed. If you eat it or sell it, that means you lied. It wasn't Afra de Ara. What Afra de Ara? You just open and drink Lechaim. By then, you have to dismiss it. Why? Because you already say it's Afra de Ara. If you eat it now, that means you lied. It wasn't really Afra de Ara. Also, some people, they don't understand, they put the chametz in the basement. They don't eat chametz, but they leave it in the basement. They think the basement is not a part of the house. The basement is a part of the house, and even if you have outside shed on your property, it's also a part of your property. Your office is your property. Your car is your property. If you have another home, vacation home, it's also your property. You have to make sure you get rid of the chametz. But that's not the topic tonight. I'm sure the rabbi here will speak and teach all the halachot of Pesach, between now and Pesach. Everyone will know what needs to be done. I came to speak a little bit Musar, different kind of uh, lecture. We need to get rid of the chametz from inside the heart. Now, in order for us to understand what does it mean, the chametz inside the heart, I want to tell you a little story that you get the point. There are, There is a mitzvah, it's called... Korban Pesach, the sacrifice of Passover. We have to take a goat and sacrifice it. Not sacrifice it. It's not all, no, the way we do it, we, we barbecue it. It has to be barbecue. And we have to eat it in groups. Chaburot. Everyone write down. I have one goat, let's say 100 pounds. How many people can eat 100 pounds? Let's say 100 people. After you clean, you need to get rid of the bones, the, the skin, all that. So 100 people will be on a group, 50 people on a group. But you have to write in advance. You make like a VIP, membership. You want to be by me on Pesach? You must register yourself by me. You don't go from one group to another. Top. Now, what's the, what's the secret of this Korban Pesach? There are two kinds of Korban Pesach. 
there's Korban Pesach that they had in Yitziat Mitzrayim, and then there's, Kor- there's Korban Pesach Ledorot, that we do later on. It's different. Why? There's very, very special mitzvah, the Korban Pesach of Yitziat Mitzrayim. It's different. Why? When Moshe asked Hashem, what zchut, what zchut the Bnei Israel has to come out of Mitzrayim, to get saved? What zchut? Everything in life, you need merit. You need some kind of a merit. You don't just get a kid that will be one day a big rabbi if you don't have some kind of a merit. Maybe one time you gave big tzedakah. Maybe one time you had an opportunity, God forbid, to take advantage on someone and make millions and you didn't do it. You had something in your life that got you some kind of a merit. You help a couple to get married. You put a kid in yeshiva. All kinds of things like this. And because of that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was very impressed from you. Now you cash out on your merit. One day you get a special gift. Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hashem, what's the merit of the Jewish nation to come out of Mitzrayim? So we have very interesting yeah. things. In one hand, the a Midrash say that they don't have any schut, no merit. Avraham Avinu, Hashem told him, your children will be in a na- in, they will be slaves to a nation, to a different nation, for 400 years. And after that, they will come out with property and wealth. After all the torture, they'll come out. The 400 years became, in the end, only 210 years, almost half. The reason is because the Egyptians push many hours of work every day, much more than the average person can work. And Hashem did the calculation. Since they work many more hours every day, now it's going to be only 210 years. But altogether, the slavery, the actual slavery was 80-something years. That's it. It wasn't 210 years. 210 years altogether in Mitzrayim. The slavery, maybe four generations, three generations. Father, son, and grandson. And maybe grand-grandson. That's it. That's the, the, the slavery. Of course, it was a disaster. They were killing babies. You know the story. They torture the people mentally. They let women work in men's jobs. They let the men work in women's jobs. So they destroy them mentally, not only physically. And while all this was taking place, the women were giving birth six bekeres echad, six in one time. Average, if you do the math, four. Four. Sometimes two, sometimes six, sometimes more. But average, every delivery has a lot of babies. While you're slave in a camp, imagine you're, you're, you're a prisoner in Auschwitz. How can you even give birth? How can you even be together with your husband? Not to talk about deliver babies and to raise them while you're being tortured and being beaten up every minute. This is a very big miracle. One rule by Hashem, it's unbelievable. Much unbelievable. Hashem, for whatever reason, we have to understand the secret here. When a person is being tortured, he gets a special blessing from Hashem. Two kinds of people get a special protection and blessing from Hashem. People that are being tortured and people that are being chased. When everybody after you, you run from the whole world, Hashem comes to your salvation. If you still have some friends, you count on people, the rabbi will help me, my brother will help me, my boss will help me, my father-in-law will help me. Hashem leaves you in their hand, no problem. But when you come to a situation that you stayed alone, everyone is against you, even if you're guilty. That's the whole point. If you're innocent, of course Hashem will help you. Who else will help you? But even when you're guilty and the whole world is after you, Hashem comes to your salvation. Elokim yivakesh tanirdaf. Also, we have another rule. If people come after you to torture you, to fight you, to make lies about you, to try to hurt you in all kinds of ways with all the lies that today you have in the world and in the internet, then automatically, yes, maybe you have hundreds or maybe thousands of people fighting you, but if you're silent, and you take the pain, and you know I'm doing the right thing, and it doesn't matter what happened besides that. I didn't come here for a picnic. I came to do what Hashem told me to do. The rest is not in my hand. 
people accept it, fine. If not, they want to torture you, they want to fight you, they want to hurt you in all kinds of ways. As long as I know I do what Hashem told me. The rest is not in my hand. Now comes Hashem and gives you a special blessing. The more you're being tortured, the more Hashem bless you. Same thing with Bnei Israel. The Egyptian had in mind to make sure they don't give birth. We don't want any more babies. What did Hashem do? Not only are they going to have babies, they are going to have babies against the laws of nature. Every delivery, a bunch. They are going crazy. What's going on here? Not only that, the Egyptians say the, the savior of the Jewish nation is about to be born. Let's throw all the children into the Nile for a few days until we see that he died. Hashem say, not only he won't die, you will raise him in your house. Just like Haman, he prepared the tree for Mordechai, and it was for him and his ten sons. Everything in life is like this. The wicked is preparing a knife for the righteous, and Hashem turn it into his heart. This is the way the world is. Mamash, people don't see it. Sometimes it takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Sometimes it's in the next life. Sometimes you don't see it in this life. Someone was after you, and he really made you lose all your money. And he put you in jail. And he destroyed you. And you think, where is Hashem? Where is all the promises that the rabbi told me in the, in the lectures all these years? How come they don't apply to me? Right? Don't worry. Hashem see the entire movie from the beginning of the generations until the end. In the end, everything will be heard by Hashem. Sof davar akol nishma. You know, the Zohar, the Zohar says something very interesting. He said that when a person died, when a person died, before he dies, he doesn't understand anything about life. Anybody here can raise his hand and say that he knows why he got this job. One guy sells carpets, one guy is in real estate, one guy is a driver, one guy... Everybody has something. Most of the jobs that people have, accidentally, they got into it. They didn't plan. When you were a kid, you have a plan, you're going to sell Persian rugs? Wasn't exactly your dream. Somehow you got into it. Or real estate. Or to be a teacher, or who knows what, or even to be a rabbi. Who planned to be a speaker one day? And Hashem directed you to where He wanted you to be. Also, anybody can raise his hand and say, I know why I got this husband, or I got this wife. Nobody knows. Everybody knows why he sometimes makes money, sometimes he loses money. Nobody knows. Everyone knows why he's happy, or why he's depressed, why, why he's healthy, why he's sick. Nobody knows. Everyone knows why he tried so many times to have kids and he only have one kid. Nobody knows. How a person say, oh, no matter how much I try not to have kids, every time, with birth control, somehow it always happens. I want one thing, Hashem wants something else. Or the other way around, nobody knows. Everybody knows why he got kicked out of Israel or out of Iran to come here to Great Neck. Nobody knows. <laughs> Bottom line, in your life, you cannot hold the Sefer Torah and swear about one thing in your life that you know why. Nothing. You know why you're born in this month? No. You know why to these parents? No. You know why you have this brother and sister? No. You know why uh, America let you in and your brother they did not let in? Nobody knows anything. Nobody knows. Rav Lau, the chief, the former chief rabbi of Israel in his book, he wrote that his, his mother had a skirt, like some kind of a jacket, and she put him and his brother under the, under the jacket to try to smuggle them to the side of the living people. And he made it, and the other one they caught. One made it, and the other one they caught. Anyone would know why? Nobody knows. Bottom line, Hashem made the world in such a way that we really don't understand that much. We only understand one thing. What do we do? Shlomo HaMelech told us the answer. Sov davar akol nishma. Don't worry, in the end you will understand everything. Everything will be heard. In the end, 
בתלמוד של only no one thing, את האלוהים ירא ואת מצוותיו שמור, כי זה כל האדם. You have only one thing to do in this world. Fear God, fear not that you shake, that oh, when is the punch going to come. That's also obligation to fear Hashem. You have to fear the punishment, you have to fear the averot, of course. But that's not the main fear. Whenever they say irat shamayim, they mainly speak about irat aromemut, that you learn who is Hashem, and just shaking from knowing who is Hashem, who is God, and how does he even care about someone like me? How does he even care about me? What I do, what I think, I did it, I didn't do it, I learned, I said, I didn't say, all kinds of things that we do. How does Hashem even care about someone like me? Like a little bug that he cares about so many times what the Jew does or none do and or the Goy does. What, how does Hashem care about it so much? That's Irat HaRomemur, when you get to understand who is this great Hashem, and then you understand that Hashem wrote in the Torah that every little thing you do, He cares very much, for positive or for negative, then you begin to understand, why, wow, wow, how did I get so lucky that Hashem cared about someone like me so much? So that's already putting you in a different level than the ordinary people who, not, who never ever think about what they do. So the idea is, the idea is like this. The Zohar said that when a person will die, every detail of your life, everything will be clear. Nobody can see Hashem and stay alive. But when we die, we're all going to see Him. Shenemar lefanav ichreu kol yodei afar. It's Zohar in Parashat Vayechi. Then the Zohar explained that we're going to get permission to understand everything Hashem hid from us. Now you understand why this girl didn't want you for the Shiduch. Now you understand why this was the Shiduch in the end and not this one. Now you understand why you didn't get married for 20 years. Now you understand why you got divorced three times. A lot of the things that you never knew, everything will be cleared. Sometimes you don't know which mistake caused me to lose what Hashem gave me. He gave me a gift. And I made a lot of mistakes. But which one of my mistakes got me to lose it? To lose the wife, to lose the business, to lose the son, God forbid. We will never know right now. But when we die, we will know everything. That's a very big gift. That now everything will be clear. But one thing we have to know, the Ramchal say that Hashem gave a person permission to only know and understand what he needs for his test. You have a test. I'm testing you all the time. I'm only giving you tools and capability and ability only to function according to what you really need to, not what you want. We want to know all the secrets. We want to know the future. We want to know everything. Hashem said, forget about it. Not right now. Right now, you're only supposed to know what's right, what's wrong. What's the purpose? Where are you going to end? If you listen to me, where are you going to end if you go against me? This is all in the Torah. Everything else is not relevant. Later on, when you come out of the body, there's not going to be any more free will, no more Bechira, no more test. So now everything changed. You're not in a test anymore. You finished your test. Now let me come and tell you the secrets. But right now, if we would know everything, we will all become depressed and kill ourselves. We won't be able to live here. Because if a person knows when he's bar mitzvah that all his life is going to be poor. Because in his previous life he was a big thief. And now Hashem put him in this world to suffer 70 years. Barely has what to eat. And his children are starving at home. Now I have 70 more years to go. Well, you know what? Jump under the train. I don't want to be poor another 70 years. Everyone around me going to make millions and I'm going to starve for donation. They kick me out like a dog. I'd rather die. You won't have the mental ability to handle another seven years. Right now, since you don't know, you keep getting strength. Maybe next week, maybe next week, maybe this job, maybe now I'm going to make the money, maybe now I win the lottery, maybe finally now my father-in-law will open his wallet after five years, you know, we'll get some fresh air. Maybe, this maybe keep you going. Same thing when a person is sick, people that have diabetes. What keeps them going? They keep hearing on the news. They invented a new pill now. No more shots. When is it going to be ready? In 20 years. 
but it gives them give them hopes. Soon I'm not gonna need to inject every day. Soon I'm gonna be able to eat whatever I want. Soon, 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 constantly, soon. That what keeps us going. Same thing in shiduchim, same thing in everything in life. That's why when a person has hope, he has a reason to live. If he doesn't have hope, he doesn't want to live. Once you don't want to live, even if you're sick, you die faster. Doctors will tell you. If you tell a person you have uh, one month to live, he gives hope. If you tell him we're still going to be able maybe to save you, there is a higher chance now that he's going to fight. It's also psychological. If you think that health of the body doesn't start in the mind, I have hundreds of proofs for you. First of all, a person can get a heart attack by getting a bad news. Someone just called him, the stock just collapsed. You know, in this moment, he just lost $10 million. <gasps> the heart attack, he gets a heart attack and he dies. What happened? Something in the mind caused the heart to stop working. If he would get good news, he wouldn't have it. He would be happy. Wow, feels so great. One second, bad news, killed him 40 years younger. You can see right away. Stress, anxiety attack, vibrations in the body, your eyes shaking, your hands, your muscles, everything is vibrating. Why? Stress. Stress, it's a psychological issue. Many other things. Meaning, even Shlomo HaMelech said that anger kills. Anger <coughs> kills a person. So the, the level of emuna, the level of trust in Hashem, actually influence us in such a way that we either live or die and be sick or be healthy, depend on our mental state of mind. Most of the problem come because of spiritual reasons. Spiritual is the seed, and what you see later on, and what comes out of it. So you see it physically, but it's definitely affect. Now, I'm not even talking about the sins and the, and the mitzvot, which also affect, because it's written in the Torah, כל המחלה אשר עשים במצרים לא עשים, אשר שמתי במצרים לא עשים עליך, כי אני השם רופאך. Meaning, if you listen to me, the sicknesses that I sent to the Egyptian, I won't send to you, because I am God, your doctor. Meaning, I let doctors be my messengers, but I am the final switch. They can do whatever they want. If I don't want them to succeed, nothing will help. The doctor did everything, like they say in Israel. אני תוח הצליח, והחולה נפטר. The surgery was successful, but the patient died. You know, what does it mean? I did everything by the book. Everything was fine. We didn't make mistakes. If we made mistakes, you can't complain to me why he died. But we did everything fine. We did the bypass. I can show you. There's a video of the entire surgery. We didn't mess up. Why did he die? Who knows why? Maybe a germ, something in the hospital, Chaydak, something, went into the system and killed him. But it's not because of me. I did everything right. But Hashem wanted something else. So let's go back to what I started to explain. Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hashem, what merit the Jewish people have to come out of Mitzrayim? Hashem said none. Meaning, since they're going to get the Torah soon, I'm giving them upfront payment. You know, when you join the real estate office, you come to your boss and say, listen, until I'm going to close a deal, it's minimum six months. How will I live until then? I need to live. I need to pay gas. I have a car. I have all these things. So he said, I'm going to give you $200 every week, $300. When you close your first deal, then we'll do the math. We'll do the calculation. Why is it? Because he understands. If he's not going to give you some money, you're not going to be able to close any deals. How are you going to live? From the air? You need food. You need gas. So he's going to give you a little bit just to survive. Once you close the first deal, you deduct. Then you can make another deal, and then five years later, you own your own office. Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to give them up front now, based on what they're going to learn. So now, they really don't have a schud, but they will have in two months. In seven weeks, they get the Torah, they begin to learn Torah. Based on that, I'm taking them out of Mitzrayim. But there is another Midrash. When we do Brit Milah, what do we say right after? Twice we say it. Twice we say it. Damaich means plural. Dam means single. Damaich means your 
פלורל בלאד, יור בלאדס, יור בלאדס, בדמייך, וואט בלאדס, טו קיינדס אוף בלאד, בלאד אוף ברית מילה, and blood of קורבן הפסח. What's the connection? The Midrash explain that בזכות ברית מילה and בזכות קורבן פסח, that's the dam that will get us enough merit to come out of Mitzrayim. I want to ask you a question. From 613 mitzvot, there are 613 mitzvot. Why these two were chosen to be the reason why we have schut to come out of Mitzrayim. Why? There's other mitzvot in, in life. From the 613 mitzvot, why Hashem particularly chose those two mitzvot? Brit Milah and Korban Pesach. The answer is, what's the significance of each one of these two mitzvot? We'll start with Brit Milah. Brit Milah, It's a mitzvah that a person does. It's against human logic, against common sense. A person has to take an innocent baby, he's eight days old, and cut a piece from his body. Imagine now if one person will bring a baby and take his ear with the scissors and cut. Right? They will call 911. They will all come, police. Who is the criminal? Him! Put the knife down. Right, the way they arrest him, he gets 15 years in prison, no? Right or wrong? At least. Imagine now he said to the policeman, wait a minute. Here, look. Five minutes ago, he cut a piece from his baby. He cut, he cut. The rabbi cut. This one cut. The president of Israel cut. The prime minister of Israel cut. Everybody cut. I show you, While they cut a piece from the baby, George Bush was standing with a white yarmulke next to it and clapping. Somebody in the White House said, Brit Mila, George Bush was standing over there. So why are you arresting me? What did I do wrong? He cut something and I cut something. Actually, what I cut is not so important. What he cut is more critical. What I cut, big deal. You make a stitches and that's it. Your ear is a little bit short. Who needs this? You don't need it. No big deal. Big deal. The boy will not have an earring. <laughs> Now the policemen become confused. They look at each other. It actually makes sense. Why, why over here we don't arrest them? And over here we will arrest him and give him 15 years in prison. Why? Why is it? Nobody has an answer to it. So it's really not a logical thing. And all over the world, you see Jews, secular Jews even, giving their life for this mitzvah. Imagine some of the traditional Jews. You tell them, you don't need Brit Milah. Anyway, you behave like a goy. Mechalel Shabbat, itaref. You don't need Brit Milah. Come on, Rabbi, what, are you cursing us? You crazy? We need to do Brit Milah. No, no, you dismiss. You don't keep Shabbat. What do you care about Brit Milah? You eat chametz and Pesach. What do you care about Brit Milah? Rabbi, don't exaggerate. I'm a Jew. I must do Brit Milah. Doesn't make sense. Women. What woman will agree that you cut a piece from the baby's body? So Hashem said, I'm going to give you two mitzvot and I'm going to test you on those two mitzvot. One mitzvah, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense to you, I want to see how devoted you are and how much you're willing to suffer physically for my Torah. That's mitzvah brit milah. Suffer physically. The second mitzvah, korban pesach, I want to test how much you're willing to risk your life and die for me, for my Torah. What's the life risk in korban pesach? Today, nothing. Even if we had bet mikdash today, no life risk. You take a goat and that's a beautiful celebration. By the The year that they came out of Mitzrayim, it was a huge life risk. Why? Hashem said to the Jews, take one goat, one year old, male, tie him to the bed on the tent of Nisan. Tent of Nisan, take a leash, tie him to your bed. The Egyptian, they bow down to this sheep. This is their God. So Muhammad will come to you and say, hey, Yossi, What are you doing with my God? 
So I'm going to make mangal, shish kebab from him. Soon I'm going to make Iranian kebab. I'm going to make from your God kebab. And the leftover from your God will go right into the bathroom. I go crazy. Imagine now the Jews in America will go to all the churches and cut the crosses from the top, cut it with sword, and put everything in a pile here in Middle Necrod or in 42nd Street or, you know, in a major place. And they make a huge pile of crosses and the Goim would come and say, what are you doing? They say, we're going to make a big fire soon. Like Baomer is coming. We're going to make Baruch Hashem big and big fire. What will happen in five minutes here? There will be a second Kristallnacht, God forbid. All the KKK, all the fanatic Christians, they're going to start burning synagogues, killing Jews, throwing them from the windows in Manhattan. It's going to be a disaster. Even Trump won't be able to help. <laughs> right or wrong? So imagine now a Navi would come to us and say, I want to save you from the Arabs. You want to get rid of all the Arabs that are torturing you nonstop? I need you four days of bravery. That's the right word, bravery? Four days of bravery. You go to all the mosques in Israel, cut that moon that they have with the picture of Muhammad, put everything in the middle of Tel Aviv and make a big fire. What would happen in Israel when the Arabs would see the first thing you cut? What would happen in Israel? Intifada multiply by a hundred. Disaster. You're not going to be able to get out of your house. So if the rabbi would come and say to the Jews, now it's your opportunity to get rid of all the Ishmaelim. They won't bother you after that. This is what you have to do for four days. Do you think anyone would come to do it? Besides some fanatic religious people that would say, Shema Israel, I'm going to die for Hashem. How many? Fifty? I'll be surprised if there will be 50. Most people won't have the guts. Won't have the guts. This is actually what Hashem said to the Jews. Take their God, tie it to the bed, that they will ask you, what are you going to do with my God? So I'm going to cut him to pieces. In your country, in your face, and there's nothing you're going to do about it, because you are nothing. My God controls the world, not your God. Your God is nothing. Soon it's going to be in my stomach and in the bathroom. <laughs> this is what you have to tell them. Do you know what the test it is? And therefore, Hashem said to Moshe, if they're going to pass these two tests, meaning they're willing to suffer for me, to cut pieces in the body, and if they're willing to die for me, they deserve the Torah. If not, they don't deserve it. Much amazing. That's why Hashem chose these two mitzvot. One is suffering all the way, one is I'm willing to die all the way. And they did it. And this is what we send Brit Milah. The blood of Brit Milah and the blood of the Korban Pesach. Now, this is what it says. Listen carefully. I'm going to pass in the land of Egypt at that night. Me and not an angel. Big deal. Why not an angel? Angel is like God. Everybody knows. Whatever the angel does, it's Hashem. The angel destroyed Sodom. Anyone say the angel destroyed Sodom? Everybody knows Hashem destroyed Sodom. The angel is not. The angel is, is a messenger of Hashem. So why Hashem is saying, me and not a messenger? It's true that the Gemara says, mitzvah bo yoter mishlucho. It's bigger mitzvah when you do it than when you send it with a messenger. But if you send it with a messenger, you fulfill the mitzvah. If a person wanted to get divorced, and he was embarrassed to hand the get to his wife. And he sent a messenger, Rabbi, from the bed in. And he knocked on the door. She opened the door. Here is your get. Moshe, your husband, send me. Here is your get. She accepted. She's divorced. Even if her husband is not there. If the husband is there, of course she's divorced. But even if he's not there, he sent it with a messenger. It's been done all the time. They get, sometimes husband run away from Israel. They hide somewhere. Finally, they locate them. They send a messenger, he bribes him, he begs him to give a get. He gives a get. He comes back to Israel and gives her the get. She doesn't ever have to see him again. You know, he's out of Israel. So why Hashem is saying, me and not an angel? What's the difference? And we say it in Agada. Ani velo malach. 
והכיתי כל בכור בארץ מצרים. Every first born I will strike on him. אני ולא שרף. שרף it's another kind of angel. Again he repeats the same thing. ובכל אלוהי מצרים אעשה שפטים. I will destroy the gods of Egypt. The Nile, that was their god, the sheep. אני ולא שליח, fair time. מי אינה the messenger? אני השם, I am God. אני הוא ולא אחר, again, four time. מי אינו one else? The Zohar said, what this whole thing here? that Hashem constantly repeated. Me, me, remember it was me and nobody else. Me, not a messenger. Me. Shelo haya raui leorid letumat mitzrayim malachim kdoshim. I'm not going to contaminate my malachim to even go to that filthy place. It's such a spiritually filthy place, mitzrayim, that I'm not going to let them get contaminated from them. But me, nobody can make me impure. I am the God. No one can make me impure. עד שלא תוכל להאחז בתומת המצרים. ובמדרש אמר רבי שמעון, גדולה חיבתן של ישראל. How much Hashem loves the Jewish nation. שנגלה הקדוש ברוך הוא במקום עבודת כוכבים, ובמקום תינופת, ובמקום טומאה בשביל לגאלם. How much Hashem loves the Jews. that he, the holy God, came into the filthy bathroom to save his nation out of there. Bathroom meaning Egypt. It was such a filthy place spiritually that Hashem agreed to come to the place of Tum'at Mitzrayim to get his children out of there, and he did not even send them malach. Now you may ask me, so why did Hashem send angels to Sodom and Gomorrah? They're also very wicked, no? Not only Mitzrayim was wicked, Sodom and Amorah was also very wicked. Who can tell me the answer? What's the difference between Mitzrayim and Sodom and Gomorrah? What's the difference? Huh? So there was no, so, no, sorry, that, then you make my questions even harder. If there was no Jews there, why to come there to begin with? Here for the Jews, Hashem is like... willing to come into a filthy place to save the Jews. But to Egypt, why to save them? Why, why, to, why to send a malach over there? Just destroy them and that's it. Why the angels have to go there? The angels Hashem didn't want to send to Mitzrayim. Why he send them to Sdom and Amorah? If Hashem afraid that the, the, the filth will contaminate the angels, should have be afraid of here. The answer is, Rabotai, let me explain to you something that you never heard before. What is the difference between the wickedness of Mitzrayim to the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah? What's the difference? Very good. There's a big difference between wicked people that are attracted to physical pleasure. Ta'avot ha'chomer. People have desires, and the desires make them wicked. Not that they don't love Hashem. Not that they want to change the truth of the Torah. They know the Torah right. They know Hashem is right. They know what I'm doing is wrong. They know, but they are in love so much with physical pleasure, such as money and food and women and who knows what. So because it's like a drug addict. The drug addict doesn't want to steal from his father money. He feels horrible that he has to do it. But his desire for the drugs is so strong, if he doesn't get it, he's going to kill himself. He cannot take the pain. It forced him to make all kinds of horrible things to fulfill his physical desire. This is Don and Amora. But Mitzrayim is a whole different story. Of course, they also have desires and physical sins. Of course. But Mitzrayim was special in rotten ideology. Like a rotten university that teaches you that you came from a monkey. That the, the world is millions of years old. All these rotten ideology that our children that goes to colleges here and they twist their mind against the Torah and they don't feel it. Rabbi, I'm still very religious. So what if I was in university? But they don't know how much kfira they put inside their mind when they were in those schools. Either public school or university or schools in Israel which are secular. There's so much kfira. They teach them that it's no problem to be gay. It's normal. It's great. 
Come out of the closet. Be on the open. No problem. We'll make you the rabbi of the modern Orthodox shul. No problem. What do you mean? It's one thing is a sinner, but why do you have to brag it about it? Why do you have to make parades? Why do you have to make everybody else wrong? It's a difference. It's one thing if he has a desire to something forbidden. No, he has desire for this, and we have desire for something else. When a religious Jew speaks Lashon Hara, it's also desire to destroy someone, or to eat something not kosher, or is not sure if the meat here in this restaurant is kosher. And this guy is gay. Each one has a desire to something physical. So there's one thing having a physical pleasure or physical desire that is forbidden. But it's a million times worse to make it a right ideology. For that, Hashem will never forgive the wicked people. When we make sins, meaning Hashem, forgive me, I was hungry, I ate not kosher. Forgive me, I really, you know I love you, I, I really feel bad. Hashem, I made a, a sin with a woman, forgive me, you know I don't want it. It was a stupid moment. But to say, that's the right way, Rabbi, you're wrong. You're primitive. That's not what Hashem wanted in the Torah. They twist everything. Like the Reform, Conservative, and some of the modern Orthodox. They des- destroy the Torah of Hashem. For them, there's no end to their punishment, these people. They took a rotten ideology that the Torah warned so many times from and made it a way of life together with keeping Shabbat. Together with Chalav Israel. Abba, we makpid Chalav Israel. Yeah, makpid Chalav Israel. But then you fight for gay rights. You want gay marriage. You rebel against Hashem and you call yourself religious. You understand what's going on here? Changing the foundation of the Torah. Why? Because they are brainwashed from all the Tarbut goim and all the things that they learn. You need to pray thousands of times to Hashem to survive this ideology influence on you because it makes a lot of people weak in their emuna. Do you know how many people I speak to and when the way they talk to me, they basically have no emuna, not even 1%. You wonder to yourself, this guy is religious. How can he stay religious when he doesn't have any emuna in Hashem? Nothing. Nothing, no emuna. Not in Shiduchim, not in Parnassah, not in anything. Therefore, he obviously does things because he doesn't believe that Hashem runs the world. Everything it's in works crazy, comes home at 11 p.m. No life, no wife, no children, suffer. I know one doctor, he told me, you know what? You have no idea how much I fight with my wife not to go on vacation. I say, why? He said, every day I lose a few thousand dollars. Makes a lot of money. Makes about a million dollars a year. So it's about 3,000 a day, no? About, no? 3,000 a day, no? 365 days. three, 4,000 a day if you take off Shabbat. So he, may, so he says, if he go on one week vacation, he lose 20-something thousand dollars. So I said to him, someone that already made so many millions of dollars, not even supposed to think about $20,000 a week. Plus, he puts another doctor to cover for him, so he's not going to lose the whole 100%, 50%. They split. The greed... He's a killer. And the person doesn't have a munah in Hashem that the parnasa doesn't come from being a doctor or how many patients you're going to see. It's crazy. It's, people don't understand. The, par- the ishtadlut, it's important. One wants to be a lawyer, one wants to be a doctor, one's a mechanic, this guy is a cook. Everyone puts some kind of an effort. But how much you're going to make? It's 100% Hashem, not the job. I know a dentist, kill themselves day and night, make 90000 a year borrow money to pay tuition for his children yeshiva. He cannot afford. It's poor. He's a very good doctor. He's a great dentist. Make 90,000 years. Say to me, what should I do? Should I quit? Should I gamble and open my own office and spend a million dollars on equipment and all the things that I'm going to need to buy and maybe I'll make it, maybe I'll get wiped out? Or I'll be slave for the rest of my life after nine years in universities? You understand? And then one guy came to me and said, you know what? You ruined my life. I said, why? He said, after you say that someone who goes to college in this country make less than a brand new Bukharian immigrants that came and drive a taxi, you, you, you took away all my desire to live. 
after student loans, after this, and after four years here, and three years over there, I really make less than a taxi driver. Why? <laughs> Whatever Hashem wants, that's what's going to happen. Some made it big time, yes, lawyers, doctors, some barely make a living. Same thing by the drivers. Some drivers have so many accidents, so many problems, that in the end of the year, they don't make anything. Also, so let's go back to what I started to say. Cleaning the house from five kinds of grains, every religious Jew does. <coughs> you don't have to convince the Jews to clean the house for Pesach. As a matter of fact, most of the Jews work a hundred times more than what they need to in Pesach. It's crazy. People kill themselves. First of all, nowhere in the Torah it says you have to clean the whole house. You have to take shelves, clean the dust, clean the attic. If you want to do it, it's fine. You want to clean your house, that's, that's up to you. Is it an obligation to clean dust? No. Do you have to clean the attic? What chametz went to the attic? Now one person went there in 10 years that you live in that house. It's all the air-conditioned pipes and some sponges over there. Nobody goes there anyway. Ma, who took a pita bread over there? Nobody ever went there with food. Right? What, are you going to open the thing, go upstairs to eat your pita over there and get cooked? So nobody, knew, but they have to go there and check with a flashlight. Man, ignorance, stupidity. Technically, it's really, really much, much, much easier than what you think. You clean the closet where all the chametz are stored. Make sure you get rid of all the ingredients that are five kinds of grains. You clean the ovens, the refrigerators, and you're basically done. Then you clean your cars. That's it. One or two days, you can finish Pesach. Everything else, it's extra. Some places, the entire house is covered with tin foil. <laughs> How much money they spend on this tin foil? You buy a little roll in Costco, $25. It's crazy. It costs them $1,000 to cover the house. Covering the faucet, covering the walls. What, did, what hamets went into the wall? Fine, where you cook, maybe the steam goes. So you cook around the oven, fine. But what over there, over there, in the closets, in the room? Crazy. They make their wife work a hundred times more than what they need to. They don't really need. You don't need to clean the chametz from the house. Mamash easy, especially when you do bitul chametz. So even if things you didn't see, you make bitul, it's done. You know, you're not sinning. No sins. But to clean the chametz from the heart, almost nobody does. A million times more important. It's very easy to clean the chametz from the house. If you have a small house, one day. Big house, two or three days. That's it. Three days you can do the house. Apartment, in a few hours you can finish. But to clean the chametz from the heart may take eight years. And if you didn't start yet, you are behind. Ooh, wow. How many years behind? Very difficult. I know. But comes Pesach and teach us a big secret. Pesach is an annual reminder that we have to clean the chametz from the heart. Exactly like he said. It's not only on Pesach. You have to do it every minute of your life, from the minute you are bar mitzvah until the day you die, you must do it. But Pesach is an annual, an annual reminder, meaning the whole concept of Pesach to know that chametz, it's puffy, it's shiny, it takes place and looks great, big, and, and matzah, thin, lechem oni, bread of poverty, did not rise like the, the, like the bluff of the Indian bread. If you ever went to an Indian restaurant, then you know what I'm talking about. If not, please don't go. You can count on my experience from 30 years ago. I went one time to an Indian restaurant in Manhattan. They say that the Indian food is out of this world. I said, let's try what it is. I went to a place. I see the prices are very cheap. Very cheap. I said to myself, how can they be in business in Manhattan? A dish so cheap like this? I'm thinking to myself. Then I realized that the trick in this restaurant is the Indian bread. Back then, 30 years ago, each Indian bread that looks like a balloon, in case you didn't see it, looks very round was $2, which is about 6 today. 
if you know the inflation from 30 years ago. So this Indian bread, it looks very big and puffy. When you make a hole with your finger in it, steam shoots out in less than 10 seconds. It falls down. You press on it. It's smaller than a bubble gum. One tiny bite and it's over. But it looks so big. Then the Indian guy comes to me, sir, you did not have our Indian bread. I said, no, no bread. <laughs> and again he comes. And again he comes. And again. He doesn't. Say, no, no bread. Then the owner of the restaurant came. <laughs> Indian bread. They get so insulted. You don't want Indian bread. <laughs> I started to think to myself, why they take it so serious? Then I realized all the profit is that Indian bread. They give it the food for cost price. And all the money they make on the bread who doesn't cost them a penny. You buy a few of those balloons, they make ten dollars a person, whatever. That's the profit. And if you refuse to take it, they're basically serving you for free. Don't come back here. <laughs> like this, literally. This is the secret of this chametz and matzah. All from the outside look flashy. Inside it's all empty. Hashem said, clean the chametz from yourself. What does it mean chametz? Chametz, it's also similar to the word chamutz, sour. It's also similar to the word machmitz. You know what machmitz means? Missing the target. In soccer, when a person kicked the ball and he missed the goal, the announcer is screaming, Achmatza! Ichmitz! Meaning he missed. Or when you score in basketball and you did not score, they call it Machmitz. Machmitz. Also, they have another word, Machti. Machti. What's Machti? It comes from the word Chet. Machmitz, Chametz. Look how it's all connected. Meaning, the Torah wants to tell you, when you miss your goal, you're a sinner. Why it was in your hand not to miss it? Machti, Chet, Machmitz, Chametz. The whole concept of Chametz, if you become Chametz, you go off target, off the path, off the derech. The idea of this whole Pesach is a reminder. You must get on the right track. Now what's the right track? In today's world, we have... Uh, a lot of the things comes from external behaving, meaning from the outside, this is the guideline. That's what people care about. What about the inside? Almost nobody cares about. You're missing the point. Let me explain what I mean. If today you will have two Jews, one look very, very ultra-orthodox, black and white, beard, peot, hat, like this. And one look half Jew, half Goy. And you will tell, you take a hundred kids in yeshiva, 13, 14, 8th grade, 9th grade, 10th grade. And you ask them, which one of the two is bigger tzaddik? Sign. Do you think one of them would say that the one that looks a little bit more in fashion is more tzaddik than the other one that looks like Eliyahu Navi? What do you think? One person will give a chance to the other one or no? Now one person even considered the chance that this is a bigger tzaddik than him. Maybe he's honest, he's not a liar, he's not a thief in a business, he treats customer beautifully, he's not a racist. He learned Torah every day, he keeps Shabbat, he eats kosher, he is a very good hospitality. People come, eat by him, he gives a lot of money to the poor, he sponsors yeshivot, he sponsors CDs for people to become religious. So, he's a little bit too much in fashion. No, so he's not 100%. Too much, he likes clothing and this. Fine, it's, we don't, we're not saying it's perfect. But the other one, he looks mamash, the chief rabbi of the world prostitution, stealing, la shonara every day, mamash no emuna in Hashem, just all a beautiful show. Why? I want to be acceptable in the public, in society, in a community. 
which one tzaddik, which one rasha? Tzaddik, rasha. The opposite of what people think. Which one will get his children into yeshiva? One, two, three. And which one will not be able to get his children into yeshiva? The one with the blue shirts and the squares can dream about putting his children in a good yeshiva. This one with the alphabet, right away, sir, first row. The whole world is a fake lie. Everything is a lie. I call Ramaut. Mazal that Hashem knows it. Imagine if we didn't have Hashem in a picture. Imagine Hashem made the world and left us alone to the laws of nature. We'd be destroyed from these lies. We have Hashem now. We have who to cry to. You know what someone told me today? Listen to this. They apply to all the issues. This is a very religious couple. And also look very religious. So there's no mistake here. Fanatic in religion. Lovers of Hashem. Righteous. Beautiful midot. Very modest. I wish every home would be like the house of this couple. And believe me, it's a blessing. They could not get their children to one yeshiva. Everything is packed. Give, give them the benefits of the doubt that they met most of the yeshivot are full. Some told them, you apply too late. We're full, full, full. Today they called me up to ask me a question. What's the question? One yeshiva called us back. We're willing to take your, your children, but we're looking for a sponsor to open another class. What does it mean? They ask. We want a hundred thousand dollars donation. Do you think you can help us to get a hundred thousand dollars donation like this? We can open another class and put your children there. Meaning they realize that this couple has some money or can raise some money, whatever the case is. Immediately they made them work for them. You want your children to come in? Get us a hundred thousand dollars. We'll open a new class. Baruch Hashem, some of these people called me and I opened up their head a little bit and said, are you normal? You even considering it? That's yeshiva. And you know what? It's yeshiva. And believe it or not, it's, one, it's considered a very good yeshiva. Uh, you and I can argue which one consider yeshiva, which one not. One thing for sure, it does not smell good. It does, it does not smell good. It does not smell good. I agree. So I ask myself, what kind of thing is this? What's going on here? People that have the best kids and the best house, they cannot put their children in a place, but someone else that connected, or whatever the case is, one, two, three, without a problem. Where is the midat I met left in the world? The emet is almost disappeared. Almost doesn't exist, the emet. The truth almost does not exist anymore. It's hard to believe what's going on here. I always say, people speak about you regardless of what you do. Nobody really cares what you do. They only care if they like you or hate you. If they like you, no matter what you do, they'll find how to protect you. It's good, you don't understand. They'll fight for you. If they hate you, no matter how much good you do, they'll criticize you. Nobody really care about the details. Everybody does good and everybody does bad. Very few people do not do bad in their life. Very few. Some of the big, big tzaddikim. But most ordinary religious people, they make mistakes almost every day. If you focus on the few mistakes that they do and ignore all the good, of course, you can murder everyone. <laughs> you can make articles, you can make uh, whatever, uh, like they say in Israel, Pashkevilim. One thing you say they don't like you, the whole street is full of notes against you. You speak up from the street, wow, they talk about me. Somebody decided to destroy you. They spend a few hundred dollars, they make million notes, spread it everywhere, in a shul, on the tables, on the, no on the walls. Your life is finished. Why? Somebody doesn't like you. Competition, jealousy, who knows what. The world became very cool. That's what Avraham Avinu said. They ask him, why, why did you tell, didn't tell us your, Sarah is your wife? You want us to go with a married woman? 
The Goyim understand, married woman, better to die than to go with a married woman. The Goyim. Back then they understood. They can kill a person in a minute, but they won't dare to touch a married woman. Unbelievable. So, Avraham answer, I know there's no fear from God in this place. In one minute you'll kill me. You don't have a problem killing a person. Meaning, it's very, it sounds absurd. You want my beautiful wife, and you're not going to touch her as long as she's married to me. So you're going to kill me in a minute. You have no fear killing me. Innocent person, just like that, slaughter me. So I know there's no fear from God over here. But it actually sounds like a contradiction. Stira ube. If there's no irat Hashem, what do they care about married women? The whole concept of marriage comes from the Torah. The Goim will not know about marriage without the Torah. The concept of getting married did not exist before the Jews got Torah by the Goim did not ex- exist by the Jews and did not exist by the Goim. The Rambam writes clearly, before Matan Torah, a person will meet a woman on the street, on a shuk, and ask her if she want to be with him, and she agree, and that's it. No problem, no marriage, no nothing. You can have kids. Once the Jews got Torah, Hashem made it now official, that you have to buy her, you have to own her, you have to give her money, whatever she wants. It can be a hundred dollar, it can be a million dollar. Every woman with her demands. But once you do it, she's yours, it connects the souls, you make it to bar, all these things. Okay. But before that, we'd never, it. but the Goim, it never changed. The Goim still don't have it. The Goim get married for nothing today. All the problems they have, they don't need to get married. You know, a lot of the Christian, they have an expression, a Catholic wedding, Catholic marriage. Meaning, once you get married, you're not allowed to get divorced by them. Ah, it says in the Torah, if something does not work with your wife, Venatan la sefer kritut, you have to give her a get. The Torah said that you're allowed to get married, divorced. It's, a, it's one of the 613 commandments. To get divorced, do it right. It didn't work out. You try, the rabbi, try to make peace. It does not work out, for whatever the reasons are. Now you want to separate? This is the way. You give her a get. 12 lines, you write, you give, you put it in her hand, now it disconnects the soul. If you be separated, five years, you live here and she lives there, she doesn't care about get, you don't care about get, and you date other people and have relationship. Every time they're with her, it's a horrible scene. But wow, well, Rabbi, she's five years without her husband. He, he went ahead and got married. He tricked everyone and got married again. And he never gave her a get. Doesn't matter, she's still connected to his soul. She goes with another Jew, very big problem. Even 20 years separation, doesn't matter, the souls are connected. Marriage is more, more than just physical contact. The souls unite. It's in a minute of the Ketubah, Reat Mekudeshedli, when he said to her, Bet Abad Zoke Dat Moshe Yisrael, that second, the two souls get connected. Moshe Feinstein, one time Zatzal was in the middle of a Sidur Kiddushin, and the man said to the woman, Areat, the ring fell. You know how all the, the Persians, Uy, Ainara, Vai, 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 Marminan, <laughs> not a good sign. First time already, half of the Persians in the place decided it's not a good Shidduch. Why? The ring fell on the floor. Now he picked it up, okay, say after me again. Up, it fell again. Now the other half of the half now. Why, why, why? Vavila. <laughs> now, 75% of the people are sure it's not a good shidduch. That's a true story. It happens in reality. Third time, the ring fell. Do you know anyone over there would think if it would be the father of the Kala? You're not getting married tonight. I told you. Hashem is saving you. Right or wrong? Now everybody talks. Oh, oh. Shh, shh, shh. So Rav Moshe Feinstein said, do it. So they ask him, Rav, are you not afraid? Three times it fell. How many chances Hashem will give? How many signs? What was his answer? What was his answer? He did not even question it in his mind for a second. What did he say? He said, in Shamaim on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote what 
day, what hour, what minute, what second, Reuven and Sarah will become one. And it was 20 seconds earlier. It has to be exactly in a second Hashem said. It changed the whole world. It's affecting the whole world. Every second, every change. It's called the, the, the butterfly effect. Butterfly moves his wings here in Great Neck. It, it affects people in China a year later. Scientifically. The scientists prove it. It's called the butterfly effect. I always say, you give someone a smack here today in New York, you don't know how far it travels. 20 years later, it's still affecting the world. So he became your enemy and he spoke Lashonara about you and somebody did not invest with you and because of that you lost money and you had to move from your house and your wife divorced you and the children went to crime. Nobody see the connection to that smack. It's 20 years later. How many miracles like this? Today they sent today an amazing story today. In Israel... Two girls went swimming. Do you hear that story today or not? Shocking the whole media. Two girls went swimming, and quickly the water pulled one of them inside. That's the mother cannot save her. The mother doesn't know how to swim. The other sister doesn't know how to swim. The mother ran to the road, trying to stop cars. Now one car stops. People, get out crazy. Why are you standing on the road? And they continue to drive. You may come and say, people are afraid. Today you're afraid to stop. It could be a hold up. A hold up. She pretends that she's a problem. You stop, somebody comes with a gun. You cannot, these people that didn't stop don't get. You, Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky in Monsi, he lived close to the church. There's a church in Monsi. They have about 10 acres land. They don't even have minyan. Baruch Hashem. But they won't sell the property. They have plenty of money. Why do they need to sell it? He used to go on Sunday and tell, hello, how are you, to the goyim that used to come to the Avodah Zarah, to the idol worshippers. They used to come to the church, the biggest chacham in America. He lived 96 years. Biggest tzaddik also. He used to come and say hello to the goyim. Why? Just imagine how much hatred would be prevented if every Jew would always be nice to everyone around him. Because their nature, yes, there are many anti-Semites among them. But even the anti-Semites, sometimes you trigger them with your reaction. By the way you look at them, by the way you cheat them in a business. After the Holocaust finished, the Polish, the Polish people came with axes and they smashed the heads of many of the survivors. After everything they've been through, they finally got saved from the camps. The Polish people came and killed them. They asked them, after everything they suffered, what did you find to go and kill them like this brutally? Do you know what they answered? Just the thought that they will come back to our economy and own again the businesses and treat us again like garbage the way they used to treat us and cheat us. We could not let it happen. What killed them in the end? The fact that they were not honest with them in a the business. If they would be nice and treat them very nice, maybe half of them would get saved or all of them. Don't get me wrong. They hated them no matter what. The Polish people, many of them are very anti-Semite. We know it. It's nothing new. But even in my own eyes I saw when you treat an anti-Semite nicely, you reduce his anger by 60-70%. And if he wants to kill a Jew, you won't be the one. And I once told you the story about the Kristallnacht, that they burned all the synagogues and all the Jewish homes in Europe. And there was one Jewish man and his son that owned a chocolate st- street. They sell candy and tea and sugar and coffee. The whole street was stores like that. In the morning, they came to see what's left from the store. Everything was burned. The only store nobody touched was their store. All the stores are burned. One store, nobody touched. In the middle of the block. The father and son, they cannot believe it. The son said to the father, 
let's triple the prices. We don't have competition. <laughs> Nobody has any more tea, coffee. Now it's the chance to make money. His father told him, shame on you. People lost everything they have. You want us to rob them now? Prices are the same. He opened the store, 11 a.m. An SS officer comes with his Jeep. He comes into the store. The father probably thought, oh, wow. We thought we got away with that. Who knows what they prepare for me? He comes into the store. They're all shaking. And he said to him, you're probably wondering why your store is not burned. And uh, the, Jew, the religious Jew looks at him. He says, I am. And he said to him, as soon as I heard that the people go and do riots and they burn all Jewish property, first thing came to my mind was your store. I came here last night with my jeep. I stood here with my gun all night. Everybody who came to burn your store, I say it's an order. Nobody is allowed to touch this store. I protected your store all night until the morning I was here. Then he took off his hat and the Jew looked at him. He said, you recognize me? He said, yes. He used to work as a delivery guy. He used to come here with a truck, deliver chocolate and cocoa and coffee. He said, yes. Do you know why the only stores I cared about was yours and nobody else here? I delivered to all the stores here. You were the only Jew that treated me like a human being. You always say hi, you always help me with the boxes, you always offered me something to drink. When I heard that they're about to burn your store, my heart did not let me. I felt I have to come and protect your store. He protected his store. Imagine how much all the other people lost from not being evil to him. It's not that they cursed him or that they told him bad words. No, they just treated him like air. He brings the boxes, leave it here, goodbye, take your money, goodbye. Nobody cares about him. The only one that was nice to him was him and he just got saved. Here you go. Why he didn't care about the others? He was happy that all the other stores are burned. You see that even a monster has inside him a point that you can trigger and make him the good come out. Any questions before we finish? Any questions? Any questions? Yes. I want to just make an announcement that we have Baruch Haim over here somewhere, right here. They, now they started a Shiduchim for religious people. You know, when I say religious, I mean Shomre Shabbat, Tres Mades, Eat Kosher. You know, no one is perfect, obviously, but you know what I'm talking about. If anybody is still single and he wants Bezrat Hashem to do Ishtadlut, please fill up the forms. And uh, Bezrat Hashem, you know, one thing leads to another. Maybe it would lead you to find your right Shiduch. Maybe it will be a reward for coming here tonight. Jokes, Rabbi, jokes. One joke. One joke. I want to thank Rabbi Mizrahi for coming here again. He always, Bezat Hashem, inspires us with good things in life. Bezat Hashem, Hashem, I pray for you in every Pesach. Thank you, Rabbi. Bezat Hashem, I will tell you a joke. One angry guy, he said to his wife, make sure the fan is only on me. Don't make the fan go left and right. Woman, make sure the fan is on my chair. Now I'm going to shul Friday night. When I come back, if I see the fan is moving, it's not going to be good here. So the wife, the wife said, no, of course, of course. When he comes back from shul, he see the fan. <laughs> he goes crazy. What? You dare to do against my instructions? She said, I didn't touch the fan. So how is it moving like this? From the minute you went out, the fan is looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> you say, only on you. He was looking for you, searching for you. Thank you very much. Chag Sameach.